Was that genuine fear? Was that little toy robot genuinely conscious when he was backing up? No, of course not. He just had a built-in sensor and it just had a little bit of programming and some very basic computational power to allow him to do that, that little interesting thing. In fact, several different interesting things. If I pull out the manual, he's got all sorts of tricks and whatnot that robot will do depending on how you move your hands stuff. It'll even throw up if you do your hands the right way. Why is this relevant? Who cares? Well, this is relevant to a cool article by Japanese researcher Manoru Asada. Artificial pain may induce empathy, morality, and ethics in the conscious mind of robots. This is a 2019 article. And in that article, Asada argues that if artificial intelligences are going to develop consciousness, if they're going to develop a sense of empathy and a sense of morality, they're going to have a better chance of doing it if they're in a physical form such that they can develop a sense of separateness and possibly identity. So for example, artificial intelligence inside of a robot looks something like this, or something like this to make my daughter happy, would be much more likely of becoming self-aware and conscious than would just a, a black box that happened to have strong computa computational power and access to a lot of information, and perhaps even some sort of sensations or inputs it needs to be separate. So this is the physical embodiment thesis, and that thesis is simply that AI is gonna have a better chance of becoming conscious and developing a sense of morality if it's embodied as opposed to cloud-based. Even if the cloud-based stuff could be even fancier and more powerful, it needs to have that sense of separateness. And the argument is that the AI is gonna to have to have that sense of separateness because that's the way that we develop a sense of morality, identity, and empathy, all those things. Asada goes over some, some basic psychology and some developmental psychology. He points out how when we're infants, our eyesight isn't fully developed and neither is our cognition. And for a time when we're very young, we have a difficult time distinguishing between ourselves and the physical world. So we're laying there and our eyes are blurry and our hands are moving around and we're just this bundle of sensations and needs and wants. And we cry and we're fed and we have some in instincts that drive us but there's confusion about what constitutes me and what constitutes everything else, let alone everyone else. At some point though, we come to recognize that, hey, these are actually my hands. And we come to recognize that those are other people. And at some, some stage, we're able to recognize that, hey, they're experiencing the world the same way that we are, maybe several years old before that happens. And we get to a point where we can empathize with the pain and suffering, pain and suffering of others such that when we see someone else in pain, someone else in agony, it impacts us. Now, brain scans confirm what we already know just intuitively based on our experience, and that's that empathetic suffering is not direct, it's indirect. So it's not the case that if I see somebody with a knife stabbed into their arm, that I'm gonna have the sensation of a knife stabbed in my arm. Instead, I'm gonna cringe, I'm gonna say, Ugh, if I know that person, and especially if I care about them, I'm gonna have a emotional, and in fact, a physiological response and a negative response, but it's not gonna be the same response or the same sensation as if I were actually stabbed in the arm. So you already know that. It's also the case that the nature of our empathy is controllable. Gate theory is just simply the explanation, I think, that we can suffer more or less empathetically based on our own conscious desires, and our own conscious control. So if we see some other people suffering, we can turn a, maybe not a blind eye to it, we can be more or less callous perhaps. We can either indulge and amplify that pain or we can cut off that pain based on our relationship or just uh, what we want to do with it. And so if we want to develop artificial intelligences embodied in robots that are able to empathize, we need to equip them with similar capacities. Maybe not with a similar experience, but at the very least with similar capacities. And Asada gives us a, an explanation for how empathy might be developed in artificial intelligence. He says the robot would get pain sensitive artificial, a pain sensitive artificial ner uh, nervous system. And he gives us some examples of sensors that are actually out there, actually being used for other purposes. We've got a magnetic field sensor and to the extent that it's depressed, it's gonna send a signal that's either more or less amplified, registering a, uh, a greater or a lesser possible pain response. Although I'm not sure we could call it a pain response based on whether or not there's a consciousness there to experience that, but I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But we'd have to give it that artificial nervous system, that ability to, to have those pain sensors. We'd have to design these artificial intelligences to recognize and be impacted by the suffering of others, other artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligences, humans or both. And so it could be programmed with the ability to sense 
distress in another's voice, to see a sad face, to see, to recognize what wailing is, and then have that higher level, second order, what we would call a physiological, emotional response would have to happen in some other way inside an artificial intelligence. And Asada says, quote, in other words, the robots would have to experience emotional contagion, emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, and sympathy slash compassion. And this would produce a proto-morality that leads to a behavior modification. The robot, ro robot begins to build others' interests into its own decision-making, no longer hedonistic, but benev benevolent. And so that uh, they actually, it gives the example of some robots that already have this sort of a, a behavior modification. And it, it was, uh, I believe, industrial-based. So it wasn't to develop consciousness or empathy or any of that stuff. It was just that if the artificial intelligence, if the robot sensed that it was causing humans pain or discomfort of some sort, it would stop, not for anything philosophically interesting, but just as a matter of industrial safety, which is a good thing. But they were able to do that, and you would want to equip an artificial intelligence for these purposes with that as well. And then the robots, Asada concludes, if they showed evidence of change in the behavior, if they showed evidence as we scan their internal computational workings, of empathy in a similar fashion as human beings um, experience empathy as we understand it. He says, robots could be agents who could be moral beings that are at the same time subjects to moral consideration. All right, here's where we get to my take. So that's how artificial intelligence empathy would come about. Um, you got the pain sensors go up to the robot brain, which would be similarly structured to our understanding of human physiological empathy and, and uh, what Asada takes to be an essential input or essential ingredient in a sense of morality and ethics. My take is that we, we shouldn't necessarily and immediately and definitely shouldn't immediately jump to say if a robot or if an artificial intelligence showed external senses or uh, showed external evidence of internal empathy, you shouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion that A, it's actually experiencing anything as an actual live consciousness, or B, that it should be considered a moral patient and then therefore treated with respect as such. So on the first, on the, on the consciousness, this uh, little robot thing that I had a second ago, it, it showed evidence of what we would consider fear. You know, it had some, some robot eyes and it, uh, it backed up and it shook and whatnot. And this toy robot unicorn, so I can pet it. And <laughs> it seems to like it. I didn't know unicorns would purr, but yeah, it seems to like that. And maybe it would show a fear response, I'm not sure. But just because it's doing this stuff, and just because it has these expressions that we would associate with certain emotions in a consciousness in human beings or even in dogs, doesn't mean there's anything actually happening in there. Doesn't mean there's actually... Doesn't mean there's anything in there actually experiencing any of this just means it's responding to the program. It's just behaving as it was programmed. And so if there's no consciousness actually experiencing the suffering, I definitely wouldn't want to conclude that it's experiencing empathy. And on the agency point, the difference between a moral agent and a moral patient is that a moral agent can actually reflect on the implications of their decisions. They can reflect on what the right thing to do is, what reasons they have to behave this way or that way, and then they can make a reasoned judgment about what to actually do. That's a moral agent. A moral patient, on the other hand, lacks that ability. So this would be small children, this would be non-human animals. I'm not sure I would say artificial intelligence is because they lack that well, as far as we know, they lack that consciousness. But a moral agent would have to think through those decisions from the perspective of a consciousness. And so, A, if, if, if we don't have good reason to think that the entity is actually conscious, and B, if we don't good, have good reason to think that it's actually considering various possibilities and acting on what it considers to be the morally right thing to do, maybe not for its own sake, but motivated as such to do the right thing, we shouldn't declare it a moral agent, and therefore we wouldn't have any reason to to jump to the conclusion that we should treat artificial intelligences that show this external evidence of possible empathy as persons, as fellow members of the moral community. However, this is still an excellent article, and I think Asada is probably assuming that his conclusions would be stronger or weaker to the extent that we better understood the physiological bases of human empathy and moral reasoning and could replicate that inside an artificial intelligence. And I think 
Asada is, is correct to the extent that we did understand that and we could replicate it, it would give us more reason to treat it as a moral agent. However, the deeper, more important question is here is whether or not that AI would be actually conscious. We've got the physical embodiment thesis. There might also be a suffering thesis here and a, a consciousness thesis where you have to have a thinking entity that's experiencing the world and also one that's genuinely suffering in a similar fashion that we are. We may give it pain receptor, receptors and it may be experienced as negative ones rather than positive ones, but until we know that it's actually suffering in a similar way that we suffer, I don't think it would be on par with, with uh, dogs or, or cats or chickens or cows, let alone human beings. So excellent article. Thanks so much, Dr. Asada. Hope you enjoy.